step out of grace Break into the wild And don't be afraid Run into wide open spaces Grace is waiting for you Dance like the weight has been lifted Grace is waiting Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom Come out of the dark, just as you are
As the Spirit is moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Yeah. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me.
for the opportunity we have to surrender it all. God, search our hearts and our minds. Tell us what you want to lay down. God, we give it all to you this morning. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, if you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in Him. He answered them, This is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Well, good morning, Broken Arrow, uh, and all of our campuses. Can we welcome all of those that are joining us at all of our other campus locations, as well as those joining us online? We're so glad that you have joined us today. And if you're watching online with us, we would encourage you to share the experience. And you grab that link and send it to someone. We'd also love for you to fill out one of those online connect cards so that we can connect with you. You know, my name is Josh. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, and I get to serve as the campus pastor here for our Broken Arrow campus. And today is Independence Day. And I know that, that many of you are, you're thinking about your 4th of July plans, this three-day weekend. Uh, maybe you're getting excited for all of the fireworks uh, tonight. Some of you have already lit them off the last couple of nights. Uh, some of you are excited about what's going to take place on the grill later today. Uh, but before we get there, I want us to take a look at a topic that is, is such a core value here in America. It didn't begin in America, but a version of it has certainly been embraced by Americans. In fact, due to where we live, we advocate for this as, as one of our rights. The problem, though, is that if we approach this concept as merely something to be attained or achieved or, or just given, then we may miss out on its purpose or settle for a lesser version of it altogether. It's something that we all desire, something that we all to some degree expect, and, and it's this. Once we get back to the beginning here, it is freedom. There it is. It's freedom. And, and you might wonder, is, is freedom really the epitome of all that, that we desire. Do we all actually desire freedom? And I believe, and I mean, certainly you're free to disagree with me, uh, but I believe that we all desire freedom. And, and there's a couple of reasons why I think this. First, uh, foremost, freedom is ingrained in us as a result of where we live. I mean, help me out here. America is known as the land of the free. free. 
Yeah, I guarantee none of you have the Star Spangled Banner on your Spotify playlist, but we all know that America is the land of the free, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. In fact, the Ninth Amendment of our Constitution is basically the right or the freedom to enjoy freedoms. And so the idea of freedom, it's ingrained in us because of where we live. But the second reason that I'm so confident that we all desire freedom is because freedom is so prevalent in marketing. And think about it. Marketing is only successful if it accurately identifies and targets what we crave and desire. In fact, I want to give a couple examples of this. We see this, uh, this advertisement here is from a company called MacPack, and, and they're saying that, hey, it, it, this is an outdoor company saying, if you buy our products, you'll find some level of freedom. Perhaps it's freedom from worry, freedom from stress, or if you vacation the way that I do, then freedom from calories. You know, companies know that we all desire freedom. In fact, recently, uh, I got a credit card offer, and uh, guess what the name of the credit card is? Freedom. Yeah, because nothing says freedom like 28% interest, right? (laughs) I don't think that they even make this credit card anymore. In fact, you might even be surprised to know that you can get freedom as an essential oil. According to the website, this can unburden you from the daily troubles and, and inspire emotional freedom. Uh, But you do need to read the fine print because it also says that you're not to use this product if you're pregnant or expecting to be pregnant because apparently you can't have kids and freedom. (laughs) At least not for 18 years, give or take a few. And you, there is something about freedom. There's something about being free that is just woven into the fabric of who we are. We crave freedom. And maybe you're here today, or or you're watching online or another one of our campuses, and and you're just exploring what you believe about God. Maybe you're exploring what you believe about Jesus or or the Bible, and someone told you that, that, or or maybe you just have this feeling that that if you come here, that that this is a place where you can find true freedom. Freedom from from past hurts and, and past mistakes, perhaps even freedom from yourself. Or perhaps, like many of us, uh, we were promised freedom if we just put our faith and our trust in Jesus. And, and so we did. And yet, if we're truly honest, many times, freedom, it just, it feels so elusive. Like, w- we know that we're free. We've been told that we're free, but, but we don't feel like it. And, and we certainly don't always live like it. And, and if we have it, then what are we to do with it? And and what I believe and what I want to suggest to you today is this, that that freedom finds purpose in service. If you're taking notes, you can write this down, that freedom finds purpose in service. The truth is that freedom, at least how it should be understood within the context of the Christian faith, freedom is not just from something. Freedom ultimately is for something. Biblical freedom, it's not a landing pad, it's a launch pad. It actually propels us with purpose into something that goes far beyond ourselves. In fact, the Apostle Paul experienced this type of of freedom and and then wrote a lot about it. And so I want us to take a look at what he had to say. If you have your Bible or or your flat screen with you today, go ahead and open to Galatians chapter 5. And this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia about 20 years after Jesus' life. And it's worth remembering that while Paul was arguably the most effective missionary in the early church, that he was not always on board with Christianity. In fact, a historian named Luke tells us that Paul was a a devout Jewish Pharisee who hated people that were following the way of Jesus. He terrorized the early church, putting Christians in jail and and even having them killed for their faith. And that might sound incredibly extreme to us today, but contextually, we've got to remember that the Jews were in this very precarious position uh, with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, it didn't have freedom of religion like we get to experience here in America today. And so the Jews, they were trying to protect their freedom to worship God. They knew that the minute things got out of hand, that Rome would come in and squash that freedom. And so Paul, like so many other religious leaders at that time, uh, he didn't want the Christians to jeopardize their ability to to, fly under the radar, so to speak. And so he took it upon himself 
to destroy the Christian church until he met and encountered the resurrected Jesus. And and this encounter with Jesus is what launched him into a brand new life. He went from being this incredibly respected Jewish leader who was trying to prevent Christianity to this successful church planter who perpetuated Christianity. I mean, he spread it across the entire ancient Near East. And and the good news is that today we are still lucky enough to have some of the letters that he wrote to various churches and people during his lifetime. And in this particular letter that we're looking at today, Paul is writing to this church in Galatia to try to encourage them to really live out the freedom that they have as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. And this newly established church had been invaded by by Judaizers, people who they were insisting that everyone needed to observe the Jewish law. And so they were distorting what Paul had taught. Paul had taught that, that freedom is found through faith in Jesus and faith alone. But the Judaizers were insisting that, that the church still needed to obey all of the laws of Judaism, and they were particularly hung up on the law of circumcision. Now, circumcision, you know, at that time, this was a Jewish practice, but it wasn't a Roman one. And so for this Roman church, as you can imagine, there's a lot of guys that are saying, hey, I'm down with Jesus, but I ain't down with that. And Paul, he realizes, he's a bright guy, he realizes, I'm about to lose half the church. And so he responds to them and and encourages them. He says, hey, it is by your faith, not by the Jewish law, that you have been set free. And when it comes to this idea of freedom, we're actually going to see three things uh, in this passage. Paul makes a declaration. He reveals a temptation for us. But then he identifies an obligation. And so we're going to pick up in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. He says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. You have been called to live in freedom. And so the very first thing we see about freedom is this declaration. We are called to live in freedom. I mean, think about that statement for a moment. God has called us to live in freedom. This is not just an American ideal or an American right. No, God's desire, his intention is that we would experience true freedom, so much so that he calls us to be free. In fact, just a few verses earlier, uh, Paul claims this in verse 1. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. I mean, this is an extraordinary claim. Not only does God want us to be free, but, but God actually initiated the ability for us to be free. He did this through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. God took it upon himself to make sure that we could experience freedom in this life. And if God made a way for us to be free, then I'm convinced there must be a purpose for our freedom. Now, it's important to note here that the freedom that Paul is speaking of is not a political freedom. We are, we are so blessed today to live in a country where we can enjoy certain freedoms, but that was not always the reality for first century Christians. Furthermore, as we're going to see in just a moment, Paul is not talking about some uncontrolled or unbridled sense of freedom. There, he says there is a moral context to it. Paul is referring to freedom from, from religious legalism. Freedom from the rules and and the regulations of the Jewish law. And within our context, we might think, well, I mean, that's great for the Galatians, but but how does that really affect us today? As modern day Christians, we don't necessarily struggle with reverting to the Jewish rules. In fact, I'll just be honest, I've never felt guilty for eating bacon. Not once. (laughs) And as, as modern day believers, we may not revert to the Jewish law, but let me just say, we relapse into religion all the time. Many of us, we live as if our salvation is dependent on how good we are. We walk around with a list of do's and don'ts, and our enemy convinces us that if we don't do enough good, or if we do too much bad, then somehow our salvation is in jeopardy. And this may resonate with you, especially if you uh, have another faith background. You know, one of the largest distinctions between Christianity and every other world religion is that Christianity is the only faith where our relationship with God comes through faith. Every other religion, it it, it requires working towards something or, or doing something or being something 
in order that you can reach nirvana or, or find deliverance or somehow appease these ethereal gods. But on the other hand, Christianity is radically different. The Christian faith is, is about what God has done for us, not what we have done for God. And our freedom, it, it has nothing to do with our abilities. And maybe this is where you find yourself today. Maybe you find yourself stuck in the cycle of of trying to earn your freedom. And you think, man, if I just just try a little bit harder, if I can just make it through this season, or if I can just finally get a break, then maybe, then maybe I'll be right with God. But the problem, as you know, is that you'll never be good enough. But thankfully, God has provided the solution. Our, Our freedom comes from surrendering our lives to Christ. And if you've yet to do that, then I want to provide you with that opportunity at the end of our service today because God has called you to live in freedom. And God has a purpose for our freedom. And so Paul makes this declaration. But next, he, he offers a temptation. And this is in continuing in verse 13. It says, You've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. So when Paul talks about freedom, he says that there is a temptation to satisfy our sinful nature. And our sinful nature, which other translations may say as our flesh, this is the fallen human nature that resists the Spirit of God. And Paul juxtaposes, not only in this letter, but in so many other letters throughout the New Testament, that that there's the Spirit and there's our flesh, and they stand in contrast to each other. They stand in contrast to what God desires for his people. In fact, next to indulge the flesh in your Bible, or maybe your Bible says satisfying your sinful nature, you can write that the temptation is really just to make it all about me. It's to live selfishly. It's giving in to the belief that somehow, in some way, we actually know better than God. And this is the lie that that our enemy feeds us. He he tells us that once we have attained freedom, once that we have arrived at a position of freedom, then somehow we have a license to just go about and do whatever it is that we want to do. But Paul's saying, no, don't abuse your freedom to satisfy things that you know are wrong. He he even goes on to to identify and, and say these desires are obvious. I mean, these are the things that we know we shouldn't do, the things that that cause regret in our lives things that that cause us to feel hollow or guilty and ashamed. You say, hey, don't do those things. Why? Because when we satisfy our sinful nature, we infringe upon the freedoms of others. And if our freedom has a purpose, then that purpose certainly is not selfishness. In fact, it is so easy to think that, that what we're doing doesn't have any effect on others, but we deceive ourselves when we think that. Not only that, but when we use our freedom to indulge in the things that are contrary to what God desires for us, we allow ourselves to become slaves to the very things that God is trying to set us free from. Let me say that again. When we use our freedom to indulge in the things that are contrary to what God desires for us, we allow ourselves to become slaves to the very things God is trying to set us free from. You know, a while ago, I read about a 38-year-old bank loan officer in Texas who was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was working at a a local bank, and he had the freedom in his position to create all sorts of uh, loan documents on behalf of customers of the bank. And, And while that freedom was meant to help the customers, he began to falsify and manipulate documents in order to benefit himself financially. And like so many times when when this has happened, there's suspicion that begins to mount, and and finally an investigation is launched, and it found that he had stolen roughly $9 million. And the U.S. attorney, when asked about it, said this. He said, you know, unfortunately, the man had access to a lot of money, and he took advantage of that. He took advantage of the bank. But what I found so fascinating as I was reading about this scenario is that when the former loan officer was asked about his sentence, this is what he said. He said, I'm at peace with my sentence. The real punishment 
is really to those who love you. He said, this experience will be way harder on my wife and my son than it will ever be on me. You see, the truth is when we use our freedom for selfish purposes, we wind up hurting friends, family members, even those that we may not know. Every decision that we make, every decision either has the possibility to promote freedom in others or infringe upon it. Every decision, it will either promote freedom in others' lives or it will infringe upon their freedoms. And so if freedom is not meant to give us a free license, then what, uh, what, what are we to do with it? What are we to do with our freedom? Well, Paul concludes with this obligation at the end of verse 13. It says, you've been called to live in freedom. Don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Paul says when it comes to our freedom, there is an obligation here to serve one another, to serve one another humbly in love. And and this, as I'm sure you can guess, is where we find freedom's purpose. The main idea, the the focal point of what Paul is driving towards is that that freedom finds purpose in service. And and this might seem so obvious to us, and in in so many ways it really is, but it's so countercultural. Our freedom— According to Paul, and, and certainly, I mean, certainly according to all of the teachings of Jesus, it's not about our rights. It's not about how we benefit. Yes, we are freed from something when we cross that line of faith, when we trust in the work of Christ, but we are freed for something that goes far beyond ourselves. Our freedom, it's meant to elevate others. Serving others is about meeting the needs of those around us. And and Paul punctuates this point when he addresses the law, the very same law that, you know, these Judaizers are so bent on keeping. He says this in verse 14, that the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. When, When Paul is referencing the entire law here, He's referencing the entire Israelite law, not just the Ten Commandments. And this was over 600 different laws. You had ceremonial laws and and moral laws and judicial laws. And Paul's saying, hey, you don't need to keep track of any of those. All of them are fulfilled if you just keep the one command to, to love your neighbor as yourself, regardless of your position, regardless of of your authority or your socioeconomic standing or where you grew up or who you know, he's saying, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the problem with laws, the problem with rules and and regulations is they're not inspiring. They're based on what we ought to do, but, but there's nothing about a law that actually encourages us to go above and beyond. In fact, the opposite is generally true. People usually are looking for a loophole. And I've never met anyone uh, who is so inspired by the tax law that they're like, yeah, I'm going to give more money to the government. (laughs) Never. And Paul is reminding us, he's saying, hey, our faith is so much better. It's so much richer than just a set of laws. Paul says it's not about what the law commands us to do. It's about what love compels us to do. As I was thinking about freedom this week, I was reminded of someone who I believe is one of the most inspiring uh, stories in in all of American history, and that's Harriet Tubman. And I don't know how much you know about Harriet Tubman. She was born uh, into slavery in 1820 on a plantation in in Maryland. Even though we're the land of the free, we we acknowledge that there are are points in our history where that has not been the case for all people. And and she worked in, in the plantation's kitchen as as a nursemaid, and and by the age of seven, she was forced into the fields to do manual physical labor. At age 12, she witnessed an overseer that was about to throw a heavy weight onto another slave, and and so she stepped in trying trying to stop the injustice, only to have this weight come barreling down upon her own head. And as a result of that moment, she spent the rest of her life with a brain injury that produced chronic headaches and and narcolepsy, the inability to to sleep. And and finally, at about the age of 30, she escaped the plantation and traveled to Pennsylvania on the Underground Railroad, where she could truly live in freedom. 
And in reading about Harriet Tubman's life, I was struck by a comment that said that once she got to Philadelphia, she worked as a a housekeeper, but she wasn't satisfied living free on her own. She wanted freedom for her loved ones and for her friends as well. And so she risked her entire life. She risked ultimately her freedom to go and be a conductor on the Underground Railroad, leading many other slaves to freedom. Some estimate hundreds of people came to freedom because of her efforts. And when the Civil War broke out, she served at Fort Monroe as a nurse, and she eventually went on to build a rest home for the poor and the needy. Her life was devoted to using her freedom for the sake of others. She didn't see her freedom as merely from something, but rather for something. Because freedom finds purpose in service. Freedom finds purpose in service. In fact, these stories like that continue even today. In fact, here at our campus, we have a couple, Skip and Stephanie, that attend our church, and recently they shared their story with me, and their story is is one of addiction. It's one fueled by loss and, and grief, tragedy. They spent years trying to be free from the substances that that gripped them. And by God's grace, they have walked in recovery now and have celebrated years of sobriety. And we celebrate that freedom. And in, in her testimony, Stephanie says this. She says, I know what it feels like to be bound. And I know what it feels like to be free. It's in the journey I got to know the one who set me free, and it's in the journey that I experienced the depth of Christ's love. But since then, she says, I have seen now how serving and celebrate recovery and sharing my story of transformation brings others to Christ and healing. It strengthens me and and instills hope in others who are still bound. She says, I love watching God restore others' lives just like he continues to restore mine. You know, what they've said as they shared has really stuck with me. You know, the the freedom of their sobriety is certainly nothing short of a miracle. But they've said that ultimately the greatest blessing of their sobriety is stepping into the ministry opportunities that God has brought to them. That they now get to walk alongside of others and help them in their recovery. Their, Their freedom has given them a purpose beyond themselves. Yes, they were freed from something, but they were ultimately freed for something. Church, we we have to remember, our enemy is sneaky. And our enemy wants to keep us enslaved. He wants to keep us bound. He will do anything to prevent us from being free. But once we've been set free, he will do anything to prevent us from living out freedom's purpose. He wants us to keep our attention on ourselves so that we will miss the needs of others. And maybe you find yourself thinking, man, I'd love to serve, but it's just not the right season. It's just not the right time. I'm just too busy. And and certainly there may be some truth to that, but I can't help but think that the enemy is saying, good, just, just stay busy. Or if I can share how it usually goes for me, usually it's, it's I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm happy to serve and, and step into a place of, of need. I just, I just don't have a lot of flexibility right now. And, and as long as it doesn't interfere with, with my plans, my schedule, if it's convenient, then count me in. Or maybe we believe the lie that, that oh, there's just, there's so many other people who are more qualified to serve in, in that capacity or, or to help someone, and, or that God only asks us to serve if it aligns with our passions. The enemy loves to feed off of our insecurity. You see, serving is not always convenient. Serving is not always comfortable. It, it doesn't always align perfectly with our giftings and, and our skills, but when we opt out of serving, when we refuse to address the needs of others, we give in to the temptation. We just make it about us. But here's the truth. Here's the real reason that the enemy wants to prevent you from serving. It's because you'll miss out on the blessings 
You see, we are blessed when we get to give of ourselves. We are, we're blessed in the relationships that we develop while we're serving alongside of one another. We're blessed when we get to be a part of seeing someone else experience freedom in their life. And, and that's why we say here uh, all the time at Battle Creek, we say, attend one and serve one. Uh, attend a service and then serve a service. That's why we have two services. Even if we had half of the congregation, we would still have two services. It's not just about having a warm body uh, to do a job. It's about expressing our freedom in Christ by serving and loving others. It's about experiencing the blessings of serving. Whether today is your first day at Battle Creek or perhaps your first day was years ago, when you came, there was someone in the parking lot. There were people who greeted you at the door or maybe even gave you a cup of coffee. Every weekend, there are people serving in our kids' ministry and our student ministry on our safety team and medical team and, and even those who serve during the week to make sure that all of us get the experience to have freedom that they've experienced. And that's why we talk about Care Portal, about stepping into the needs of, of our community, of walking alongside of those who are in difficult situations and saying, let me provide freedom. Let me show you what it looks like to have a family while we speak of serving alongside of our community partners with, with troubled teens in, in our Tulsa area or our food banks, we don't want the enemy robbing us of blessings that God wants us to give. God has not called Battle Creek to be a cruise ship. He's called us to be a battleship. It's in the name. Battle Creek. God wants us manning the positions. He wants us exercising our faith and our freedom because freedom finds purpose in service. That's why one of our core values is that everyone needs a place in the church and a purpose in the world. And to those of you who are here today that you're serving, you're in one of our environments, you're helping with our missions team or our care team, we want to say thank you. And maybe for you, maybe the question to ask today is, who can you invite to join you? If everyone truly needs a place in the church and a purpose in the world, then who can you bring to be a part of the journey? Or, uh, to those, maybe, you've, maybe you were serving, but you stepped aside for a season. The question I would have you ask is, is the reason you stepped aside still valid today? I think there are times where, where God may have a step aside, but I think the enemy wants us to stay there much longer than we should. And perhaps you've never taken that step. Maybe you've been an observer. Maybe you're even saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a raving fan of Battle Creek Church. I think God is saying, hey, no more sidelines. God wants you in the game. And maybe you're brand new with us. You're saying, I, I just got here. And if that's you, I would encourage you to, to sign up for our next advanced track experience because it's designed to help you take your next step. It's designed to help you advance in your journey with Christ. You know, at each campus, we're gonna talk about some of the opportunities to serve and how you can serve in just a moment. In fact, I'm gonna invite campus pastors and, and those that are there to go ahead and come forward. But before we do, I wanna acknowledge that while freedom is for something, there may be some here today or another campus or online that you've yet to experience freedom from something. You might be thinking, hey, I'm ready to jump in, but I don't yet have the freedom that comes from Christ. You may be asking, well, what does that even look like? I believe it, it means acknowledging that you're broken, it, acknowledging that you're not perfect, but that through faith in Christ, you can be renewed. God doesn't want you to get your life together before coming to him. He knows that you can't. You can't do any of that without him. It's understand that there's nothing that we can do to be saved. It's only through Jesus, only through God, that we can attain that salvation. And God is saying, I'm able, I'm willing to forgive you if we let him. That's why Jesus, why God in the flesh came to this earth and died upon a cross. It's believing that, that even though Jesus was perfect, he took upon himself our imperfections so that they would not separate us from God any longer. And scripture tells us that when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. 
And so for all of our campuses, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes at this time. And for our campus pastors and those that are there, you can go ahead and lead out in this prayer. For those of us that are here at Broken Arrow or watching online, if you've never made that decision, if you've never taken that step to trust Jesus, then would you pray this prayer after me? You're not going to pray alone. People all around the room are going to pray. But would you just pray, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. But today I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, come into my life to be my Lord, my Savior, my forgiver. And in the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I give my life to you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you made that decision today, we want to...